Hello and welcome once again to one of our Sunday messages, this time shooting from inside of the Fellowship Hall where we've had so many wonderful potlucks that we look forward to coming back to someday in the near future, we hope. It's cold outside, that's why we're here indoors and I'm Pastor Kevin coming to you once again from or on behalf of Aromas Bible Church. I've got kind of a serious message today in, in some ways, so I want to start with something lighthearted. It's one of those St. Peter heaven jokes, and it begins like this. A man who we'll call Ralph dies and meets St. Peter. St. Peter says, Ralph, you are indeed a good man. Come, I will walk you to heaven. So they started walking through a long hall, and on the walls there were lots and lots of watches. Curious. The man asks, well, what's the deal with all these watches? St. Peter says, you see, these are called lying watches. Every time someone t tells a lie, the arms move. Look at this one, for example. It belonged to Mother Teresa. Its arms have never moved, not even once. We also have lying watches for every profession of mankind. Here are the lawyers watches, there are the engineers, and there are the farmers' watches. Well, what about this empty spot, St. Uh, Ralph asks. St. Peter says, oh, well, that used to be used for the politicians' watch. Ralph asks, well, what happened to it? St. Peter says, well, Jesus uses that one as a fan in his office. I thought that was kind of cute and a worthwhile way to break the ice this morning. Today there will be no dramatic whistles and bells. I just want to engage you in some old-fashioned straight talk. There's been several things on my mind that may seem disconnected if I just roll them out there. So I want to try and show you what the common denominator is in all of them. My title says it all. If you want to finish strong, you got to start right here. This message is about living purposefully with enduring faith all the way to the end. My goal is to encourage you to persevere at being about the Father's business to the very end. Seems like a good place for us to pray before we start. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, we come to you now and we ask God that you would show us what it is you want us to see, what this message has for each and every one of us. Even if it's just one little morsel, God, would you help us to go away from here with something that is edifying, enriching, challenging, moves us into a closer, deeper walk with you. This is my prayer for each of our, uh, our friends, brothers, sisters, uh, church family watching today. And I pray these things then in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's my purpose. I want to encourage you to persevere at being about the Father's business to the very end. So, here's what you can expect to find uh, in the message today in terms of components. I want to make application of last week's Valentine's Day message based on some personal self-examination that it stirred up in me. The second thing, I want, I, I want to show how that application of the self-examination that I got from the Valentine's Day message connects with the nature of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus outlines in the Sermon on the Mount. We've been looking at the Beatitudes, all part of the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to include some anecdotal illustrations from this past week that uh, I've made personal connection with to uh, this message. Number three, I want to weave in the value of using the remaining days of Lent to prepare us for Easter. It hasn't been my personal tradition, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have value, and it doesn't mean that we can't take a look at what it might do for us. And finally, 
I want to show ways that we can work together as God's church in Aromas to purposefully be about the Father's business. That's a tall order, isn't it? Well, let's begin. The first thing, repeating this then, I want to make application of last week's Valentine's Day message based on some personal ex uh, self-examination that it evoked in me. So as I prepared my Valentine's Day message, I felt convicted to do some self-examination. It was unavoidable. Self-examination can be uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Someone has said, one of the famous uh, philosophers, that an unexamined life is not worth living. So I've I have some questions that help to capture the nature of the self-examination. I'll start with this one. The question is, I'll speak in the first person, but I'd like you to apply it to yourself. How consciously do I, how consciously do, do you practice loving the way Jesus commands me to? To love God, to love my neighbor to love my enemies, and to love myself. The message had me thinking about how Valentine, St. Valentine, Stephen, or St. Stephen, would pay the ultimate price by taking up their cross to follow Jesus in Jesus' footsteps as martyrs for their faith. Both men model what it means to love God, to love their neighbor, and to love their enemies, to receive the ultimate reward in the end. They paid the ultimate price in this life to receive the ultimate reward in the end. Could living like that be what loving self is really all about? that we are living for others, that we're willing to pay the price in this life by taking up our cross as Jesus has instructed us and following him, regardless of the cost. You can see why I would be challenged by these thoughts. We saw that with St. Valentine and with uh, Stephen. We've seen it with Jesus, who I think they model so well. I recently heard a profound but humorous quote. It's an, it came from a delightful movie called The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, and it goes like this. Everything will be okay in the end. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. Isn't that wonderful? This quote is often uh, um, mis- attributed to John Lennon. It's often attributed to John Lennon, but he didn't originate it. It came from a Brazilian writer named Paul Coelho. And then the best exotic Marigold Hotel adopted it, and now it's mine too, and yours. Everything will be okay in the end, and if it's not okay, it's not the end. It's a wonderful illustration of a second chance. It's a wonderful illustration for not throwing in the towel when things look bad, when, it, when things aren't okay. Don't stop there. Sometimes we wring our hands in despair, thinking we've reached the end, the end of our rope. All we can see is a precipice devoid of hope and nowhere to turn. In times like these, when things aren't looking very okay, we can be encouraged that maybe it's not really the end after all. This is one to really take to heart. Maybe it's not the end. Some, sometimes we just think we've hit the wall and there's no more and it just couldn't get any worse and we have no hope. Now that quote sounds very much like Yogi Berra's famous quote, it ain't over till it's over. Well, I wondered where that came from specifically. 
And the occasion was when his team was losing the 1973 National League pennant race in baseball. They were a long way behind when he said it, but they did eventually rally to win the division title. It ain't over till it's over. If it ain't okay, it must not be the end. Now the Bible has many such examples like this one from 1 Samuel 30 verses 3 through 6. I've always liked this passage. It's about David and his mighty men that were out in the wild uh, hiding from Saul, always on the run, always on the move, but also doing the Father's will, which was to rid the land of the Philistines, the God-haters that hated Israel. And it begins like this in verse 3. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Apparently that had been their base camp while they went out on one of their expeditions. So when they come back, they find it destroyed and their wives and their sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But I love this. It's not the end. It seems like the end. Things are not okay. But David found strength in the Lord his God. I often have wondered, what does that look like? How do you find strength in the Lord your God when your own men are talking of stoning you? Everyone is so grieved and the loss is so great, they want to destroy you, the leader. How do you find strength in the Lord at a time like this? Well, the Bible doesn't specifically say here, but we know that David's relationship with God was very intimate. He cried when it was a time for crying. He complained when it was a time for complaining, and he praised God in it all, ultimately. So do you want to know what came of that story? I would think you would. I'm leaving you with a cliffhanger on this day when his men were ready to stone him and David is finding strength in the Lord. If that had been David's end, that would definitely not be okay, right? We have to wonder what kind of purpose that would serve. And so I encourage you to read on. I'm not going to tell you how that ended. It's a, a read 1 Samuel chapter 30 and find out for yourself. Find out how it applies to this message and how it might encourage you. Now, you might even want to take note of that verse. Write it down right now. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Read the whole chapter. But you might want to note it on the front of your Bible and you can put or on the refrigerator or on a bottle of sleeping pills you might take when you think it's the end. Write it down and put it under the heading, it's not the end yet. And then when you're feeling down and it seems like everything is dark and dreary and everything is hopeless, you go to 1 Samuel 30. It's just one of the many places that you can find encouragement and hope. So let me remind you of what we're talking about. I said we would make application of last week's Valentine's Day message based on some personal self-examination that it evoked in me. And now we move on to the second thing, which is to show how the application of self-examination that I got from the Valentine's Day message connects with the nature of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus outlines in the Sermon on the Mount. How many of us have a life story that will, will be remembered for mirroring what we see in the followers like 
Steve and Val. I hope you don't mind if I get informal with Stephen and Val, Valentine, St. Stephen and St. Valentine. I want to just bring them in a little closer so that you can also see them as ordinary people, just like you and I. Ordinary people that went the distance, that persevered in their faith to do the Father's business to the end. The self-examination questions, beginning with this earlier one, go like this, and so I'll repeat it. How consciously do I practice loving? We were looking at loving, loving God, loving our neighbor, loving our enemy as we love ourselves. We were looking at that. The second question then that we'll um, look at today, and I'll ask you now, is do I even come remotely close? to living and forgiving as Steve and Val did with their enemies, just as Jesus modeled and instructs us. Do I even come remotely close? You might say, well, I'm going to make sure I'm forgiving, I make sure I'm loving God, and I'm going to make sure I'm loving my neighbor, and I will love my enemy even, and it will be put to the test. I can assure you, it will be put to the test. And you're going to need some extra help there. You're going to need some divine assistance because you can't do this on your own. So don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to go to God and say, God, I have this problem. I don't like my neighbor. And I can't stand that guy over there. But I sure do love you. He says, nah, I don't think you even understand the first thing about loving me. Because you can't love me and disregard what I've said that will look like. A next question. How serious am I about conforming my life to the kingdom standards that Jesus taught in his Sermon on the Mount? When you read those, they are so... Uh, incongruent with the way we live, are you really able to do that? How serious are you about adopting and adapting to that way of life? That's a question. That's a self-examination question that as we're doing these uh, messages, as we're reading, as we're listening, as you are uh, receiving them, do exactly that. Listen, read, receive, take them in for yourself. Ask those kinds of questions. Ask God to provoke those in you. Am, and the next one then, am I willing to pay the price of carrying my cross in this world for Jesus' invitation to eat hat his table as a kingdom citizen? Am I willing to pay the price of carrying my cross in this world for the invitation to eat at Jesus' banquet table in the kingdom of heaven that we look forward to, don't we? The discomfort of self-examination pays off, though, if you and I want to want things to be more than just okay. Okay isn't good enough. That's just the, the word that's used in that quote that I have given. Still a good quote. But don't we want a little more than just okay? Because before the real end comes, we have this exhortation from Hebrews 4.16 to help us go the distance and finish strong. I want to introduce this phrase now, finish strong. Hebrews 4.16 gives us an exhortation to go the, dinish, the distance so that we can finish strong. Here's how it reads. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We're being encouraged to go before the throne of grace, to approach God 
with confidence so that we may find mercy, God's mercy and his grace to help us in our time of need. Now that can be every day, can it? We need mercy and we need grace because we are people, we are needy people and we live in times of need. Our lives are a time of need. Now don't you want to go the distance and finish strong? I want to give you a little uh, illustration, a real life illustration from a man named Hal Johnson, an elderly man who has, uh, has passed on. But before he did, he came to this church a few times, sat in the front row, hard of hearing. Uh, his, the years showed on his body. Years of a life lived well. Well, how do I know that his life was lived well? Well, I have known Hal for many years, actually, prior to him coming here. And the thing that Hal said that really stood out to me, especially from an elderly man because I'd never heard it before, he said, I want to finish strong. And there was determination in his heart, humble determination. He was approaching the throne of grace confidently to receive mercy in his time of need. He wanted to arrive there at the end and hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And what that, he knew that what that required is that in this world, in this life, in the one chance we get, he wanted to live his life well and finish strong. I said, how did I uh, know he finished well? When he passed away, Nancy, my wife, Andy, and I all went to his memorial service at Mount Hermon that was held inside of the chapel there that many of us have sat, have sat in for concerts and uh, messages and various things. It was a full house. And from the sampling of people that spoke of Hal, it was very evident that Hal had lived well. We could only hope that those kinds of words would be spoken about our lives. And that it comes from his having said and having lived in accord with wanting to finish strong. The Apostle Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord will award me on that day. Hal was mimicking that same idea. So I ask you, do you want to go the distance and finish strong? It's a pivotal question because there is a price, there is sacrifice, there is a priority that must be established in your life to do this. It won't just happen. If you want to finish strong, you have to take ownership of, of how you live now with an attitude of siempre adelante, nunca atroz. Always forward, never back. That's the attitude you have to live life with if you want to finish strong and go the distance to the end. Persevere to the end. I have another little heading I've written in here, and this is one of those anecdotal ones. It's something that caught my eye this past week. I call it moth on the bathroom wall. And I guess, and I think you can guess what that would be about. Maybe you've seen a moth on the wall, maybe even on your bathroom wall. It's a moth that I saw that's spending, apparently, its entire lifetime glued, in a way, to my bathroom wall. It doesn't even really move. 
I poked at it to see if it was even alive, and it is. It's alive, but that defines its whole life. And it seems to me like it is a very purposeless life. I fully expect to find Mr. Moth dead soon and rinse him down the drain after he has surrendered his whole lifetime, day after day, without a purpose, and then comes the end. Do you see the picture? We can be like Mr. Moth, stuck somewhere irrelevant, We've planted ourselves in a place where nothing is happening because we're comfortable there, but not realizing necessarily that our life is ebbing away. And too soon comes the end with nothing to show for it. There's another anecdotal experience that I, uh, uh, that I had this past week. I call it waiting in the wrong line. Nancy and I had gone to CVS in Capitola where we had gotten scheduled for our first COVID shot. And there's a, there's a waiting list and you can't go in before it's time to register. And, and so they space people out so that each one can get their shot in 15 minute increments. And so there's uh, arrows on the floor that guide us around to where uh, the, the booths are for the shots. Nancy and I go around there. She's just keeping me company because she's already had her shot. I happen to glance behind me and I see a young woman waiting at the arrow behind me uh, at least six feet away. And uh, I'm thinking, she doesn't look like she's an elder. And I'm hesitant uh, to say anything, not wanting to be intrusive or seem fresh or anything like that. But I moved beyond that and I turned and I said, you know, you don't really look like you're a senior that would be in line here to get a COVID shot. And the lights came on and she said, oh, you know, they've rearranged this place since I was here before. This used to be the way uh, to wait for your, the line to wait for picking up your prescription. And so with that little bit of information, she was able to step out of the line and go to the back of the right line. I call that waiting in the wrong line. Jesus doesn't want us to be waiting in the wrong line. I suspect that living for the king here and now puts us in the right line for entering into the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom. It suggests that the kingdom of heaven has a king. Now, we've just been scratching the surface of the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, and I know I said we were coming to the end of that, but I can see that we're really not. There's so much more to draw out of that. I love, I want to say this too, I love hearing from people that are getting something specific out of the message. And one of our church family came to me and said they'd never heard any sermons on the Beatitudes. And it prompted them to look into them, to read them, to take them in for herself and thanked me for it. And it was very gratifying to me to know that someone is being motivated, being inspired to check it out for themselves. That is the nature of a Berean. When the books are opened and the roll is called up yonder, I surely don't want to find that I wasted time standing in the wrong line. Preoccupied with whatever it is, the gal was looking at her phone as we're almost all doing when we're not active with something else. And you can be in a whole different world there. You can be preoccupied with something and you are in the wrong line and you don't even know it. And meanwhile, your life is ebbing away. If you... Um, uh, if you project this onto the larger spectrum of life. And that's why 
just as I drew her attention to the fact that this isn't, you don't look like you want to be in this line, that's why I'm drawing it to your attention so that uh, I wouldn't want to withhold it from you. I want to ask you, I want to challenge you to ask yourself, am I standing in the right line? Is this the line that Jesus would want me to be in to enter into the kingdom of heaven? You know, he warned us that, the, the, that he was the gate, the narrow gate, that the path is narrow that leads to eternal life, whereas the road is broad that leads to destruction. It tells me that where you see a lot of people streaming through, there's a very good chance that that is not the road you want to be on, not the line you want to be waiting in. And the world is full of wide gates that draw us in and attract us. And we see the movement of other people and maybe people we, we have high regard for. But Jesus wants us to evaluate our lives for ourselves and check in with him. Check in frequently. Check in his word. Take in his word and uh, live accordingly. Then you will have the discernment to know what line you're in and make the adjustments. The third thing I said I would uh, bring into focus here would be to weave in the value of using the remaining days of Lent to prepare us for Easter. It's less than 40 days away. away. We're already two days into Lent. And I, I only just discovered it for myself because it's not... Uh, so big a part of my tradition. I only discovered it for myself by uh, uh, using what's called Lectio 365. I've sent the link out to everyone on our mailing list, and I would encourage you to check it out. Download it onto your phone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, and set some time aside to engage that. This is a special time that Nancy and I try to have First thing in the morning before the busyness of the day starts because in no time at all we're consumed with that busyness. And this really helps us. Well, it was in what, listening, and you can listen and read the, the, the daily 365s, uh, Lectio, Lectio 365s, that I discovered that Lent had begun. And it gave great guidance for how to begin that. So I want to encourage you, uh, because all of a sudden Easter will be here, and like Valentine's Day, it might just be one more uh, minor holiday, but it is a high holiday. It's an important one. It is when the price was paid for us on the preceding days, and the resurrection to life occurs, and the way has been made for our regeneration and resurrection life. But in this regard, the fear that I have, and you've heard me speak on this message before, I'm processing through my own stuff. The, the thing I fear is that place where Jesus tells, actually it's a parable, where he tells a certain group of people that seem to have this relationship with him or seem to be busy about the father's business he tells them depart from me for i never knew you and i think about how that's so much about relationship it's not about what you're doing it's not about all the things you can mark off on the performance basis that justify your uh, standing as a christian he says no no I, I never knew you you didn't spend any time with me it wasn't important enough. You were interested in doing things that you could chalk up to your credit, but where were you? Why would you want to spend eternity with me when you don't even know me? You haven't really indicated that you want to live the life I've told you about. That's a passage that concerns me. That fits in with my self-examination and my wanting to know, am I living the kind of life that Jesus advocates? 
the kind that he uh, invites us to and the kind that he rewards. I'm, a, I'm an active guy. I've got a lot of ambition, a lot of drive. I love working. The other day, it was a sunny day. I was out early in the morning checking the water in a water tank, the water level, and as I'm coming down the hill, I'm looking at wood that needs to be cut up and processed and weeds that need to be uh, removed and, and all of the, the things. And those aren't the creative fun projects. Those are just the, the daily work that needs to be done. And I love it. But because of being that kind of person, I'm not one who is inclined to be still and know that he is God. But you know, God created us as human beings, not as human doings, right? And so I see this is an area that I really need to be conscious of. And so I want to, uh, I want to impart to you that your change can be one area, one small thing that you know uh, is like a, a, a row of dominoes that if you take this one, you can knock out a lot of others that are hindering you. That's the point of that. And so I know that I need tools. I have referenced the three-minute retreats that I have used, uh, the Lectio 365. Um, I have a... a, a spiritual brother and I'll call him a mentor, Bud Lamb, who has, uh, is doing a series he calls Ancient Pathways, a sort of a weekly podcast. And he's written a book recently. I would encourage you, if you're interested, to uh, get with me and let me know that you would like to check those out. A, a month and a half, maybe two months ago, Nancy and I were invited to an association getaway in Monterey, and I was given a book there called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Now, I'm pretty good at starting a book, but rarely finish them. There are other things that are pressing me, and so I rarely finish them, but I picked it up the other, other night and, and, and opened it to a page where there was um, numbered definitions that were for self-examination. If you're this kind of person, if you're this kind of a person, you are, uh, you are a victim of the hurry syndrome. You qualify, and I qualified for all of them. That's what that book is for, is to tell us that God didn't mean for us to live that way, and we miss out on knowing Him when we're that preoccupied. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Lent. I mentioned Lent. The value of Lent is that we, get to, we have the opportunity to incorporate some spiritual disciplines that we can give something up. And I've established with Nancy, uh, because then we can support each other in doing these things and go the distance, uh, we've decided to uh, forego a couple of things and along with that to, uh, on a daily basis, to fast one day a week. And it's very noticeable when you're doing that because we are neophytes, we're babies at it. But the opportunity there is there to uh, be uh, mindful when you're hungry, for instance, or when your habit at the end of a meal is to uh, have ice cream or to have a glass of wine with your meal. When you forego those things, you notice it. It has been a routine. And Forgoing those becomes a very obvious thing. You can use that, that prompter then for prayer. You can use that prompter any way you want in any spiritual dimension to your benefit. Now, I, the last thing I wanted to talk about here was to finally show how we can work together as God's church in Aromas. I see Aromas Bible Church as kind of a little outpost. We're off the beaten path, and yet it is a, a, a we are a people. God's church in Aromas is a small group of people. And we have a purpose. He's given us a mission, a work to do, and 
He lets me largely define what that mission is. I don't want to be out here all alone, though. And so, first and foremost, I want to applaud this congregation for how it has responded to uh, the ministry Koopa, where we are involved in, with Cuban pastors. And the most recent thing being the Pay It Forward campaign to purchase the uh, phone recharges. Um, there's been a, a wonderful response to that. And in fact, um, Edita McQuarrie, who is a writer for the Santa Cruz Sentinel, um, is preparing a story about Koopa, the Koopa ministry in Cuba. So we're going to get some broader exposure. Now, having said that, with the compliment for what you have done already over the past year, because it's just one year ago, more than the past year, because you funded a trip that Ted and I made just one year ago, mid-February, like it is right now. You've done so much to make it possible for them to do so much. But what I want to say is I'm not going to be promoting Koopa from this point for a little while. Understand me, though. It's not that I've uh, I'm no longer interested in doing that, but we're not a one-trick pony. We have many other ministries, many other agencies and causes that we support in a small way. I want us to begin now to look at some of these others and make sure that they're getting some equal time, equal uh, engagement on our part. And one that's coming up very recent, very soon, March 5th, in fact, I believe uh, that's just a couple of weeks away, um, is a special program prepared by Voice of the Martyrs. And I'm going to be sending out, along with an, an update letter about Koopa, a flyer about this event that you can register for online. It begins at 6.30 on a Friday night, uh, which I believe is going to be uh, normally our, our normally scheduled in Jesus' name we pray night. But I think that this is a worthwhile thing for us to, to turn our attention to. It's going to uh, be fodder for our prayer lives. So you'll hear more about that. And, and it's just an example of how I want us to not be a one-trick pony. Many years ago, uh, we were doing a WANA here, and it took all of our resources, and we could only really focus on that one thing. Good as it was, it, it, it didn't achieve the fullness of what we're capable of doing. Well, I think that about wraps it up. I want to say, though, that the God of the second chance might be saying to you, Everything will be okay in the end. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. It ain't over till it's over. And it ain't over until God says it's over. And when that time comes and when the roll is called up yonder, you want your name to be written in the book of life. And you want that book of life to reflect your life lived here, where you have stored away your reward in heaven, where he will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come into the joy of your master's house. So don't lose heart. Be encouraged and encourage someone else. Well, God bless you. And thank you for spending this time with me. Let me close in prayer. Lord, you are so good to us, so patient, so um, uh, willing to give us another chance. And God, we don't want to come empty-handed, handed, and it's not just about what we do. It's about who we are in relationship to you and with you. And so, God, I ask that for each one of us in whatever our, our area of need is, that we would grab hold of 
what it says in Hebrews, to come before you with confidence, with boldness, before the throne of grace, to receive mercy and grace in our time of need. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.